Hello, my name is Kato Muir. I'm a Ngalia person and I'm speaking Ngalia. Wadei, ngai go yini Kato Muir nga, ngai nga yarnango Ngalia, ngai go nya miri tiaroro, tia ngai go Ngalia. My language mentors were my parents. Uh, my mother's passed away now, but uh, she was fluent in seven uh, languages and uh, was very, um, flu the fluency was a, as a native speaker, so I spoke with the accent and uh, the intonations and everything. Um, we, I grew up learning more Juban than I did anything else, uh, then across to Wangava and then back to Ngalia, which is my mother tongue. Most of the words, uh, you know, the family members that we hang out with were all Juban speakers. Um, I'm not a great fluent speaker of Juban, but I know enough to recognise it and get by. Um, but a lot of the words that I learnt were, um, you know, things like uh, cave, for instance, uh, chundi or um, burba. So, you know, I learn all these, uh, yeah, so but basically in growing up I've learnt words from a variety of different languages um, that I was exposed to. I think um, from my parents who specifically pushed me to become literate in the language and we were grateful to use the materials produced by uh, Wolf Douglas, who's, who was one of the language pioneers in the region, and his series of uh, books, the Wanga series, uh, one, two, three, four, and five. Um, so, yeah, my language mentors were my parents, um, Wolf Douglas indirectly through his books, which I was then able to use to uh, learn how to read and write in language. And along the lines, there were other people that came into, uh, you know, my, my life or my orbit. One was a man, one of the Solomon brothers uh, from Robin, who in conversation impressed uh, that, you know, whatever you do, you need to be able to speak a language. It doesn't matter if it's your own language, but somebody's language. And that was a conversation we had and that, that sort of stuck with me for, for a long time. And yeah, so basically having the opportunity then to establish um, the Goldfields Aboriginal Languages Project through the Ngalia Foundation and uh, striking up the partnership with the National Trust. I was happy to build on the work that my parents had done on the Ngalia language. Um, sadly, uh, by the time we started working on Juban with my mother, her, you know, she'd started to uh, dementia and those sort of things set in, so we weren't able to pursue that too much further. But through developing the um, Goldfields Aboriginal Languages Project, uh, we're now very happy to see that um, a lot of our languages that were close to extinction are now, you know, coming back to, um, well, back to life. And uh, that's a great achievement. And I think at this language uh, conference here in uh, the Goldfields Arts Centre today, you know, we're seeing these languages come back uh, through performances by young people and uh, a lot of the research work. So just this morning, for instance, um, I've got an email from uh, a professor at Yale who has been working on our, um, oh, I'm a co-author along with Sue Hansen and uh, the students of, uh, from Yale and we've just finalised the Ngalia sketch grammar, uh, which will go to press and um, over the next few months, uh, we'll have the the full, well, not the full descriptive, but a sketch grammar of Ngalia language produced that built on the work of my parents, uh, the work that uh, Sue, myself, Dad, and uh, my brothers have done. And uh, yeah, that's quite a significant achievement that we're quite happy of and proud of. It's very, very hard in this modern age, uh, living in a in modern Australia, to be able to maintain and transmit languages across generations. Um, the work that I have been doing is to create learning materials that uh, then accessible. So 
you know, my children were exposed to languages as, as children, but um, they're not strong speakers. Uh, they do have some understanding, and I hope that by developing these materials, they're able to then access that. Um, so it is a lifelong journey as well. So you, if you're not a strong speaker as a child, you still have the opportunity, having been exposed, to learn and take on the language later on in life. Some people say two worlds, I mean, it's interesting because I suppose for me it's, it's just my world. Um, I have a, you know, a pretty powerful pedigree in terms of uh, my white Australian ancestry, um, having ancestors come out uh, from Scotland in the 1820s um, and, you know, following the family tree back we've got convicts uh, coming from that family tree we've got ancestry um, that include convicts, uh, police commissioners, uh, republicans, all of these and dad as a young man or a young boy uh, leaving home and pursuing a life in outback uh, across Australia uh, and coming in to meet and marry and uh, you know uh, build a life with my mother who's a tribal nomad. To me it's just normal. Um, Although reflecting on it, uh, you know, sitting out under a mulga tree in the in the desert, having a meal and giving being getting instructions on how to have table manners, uh, and I remember that uh, that episode, oh, the, these sort of instances where Dad's saying, "Yeah, you're living out in the bush out here, but you know, never know, you might end up sitting at a table with uh, important people, and you need to be able to know what the table manners are." That sort of thing about living in two worlds to me it's uh, just part of my life um, and I'm able you know very fortunate to be fluent and proficient in the Aboriginal language or the Australian language as I say and uh, also fluent and proficient in uh, English.